Good morning, everyone. Welcome, brothers and sisters, to First Church, an open place for all here in the heart of beautiful downtown Birmingham. My name is Todd Brown. Folks just call me Buzzy. I use he and him pronouns. Since coming here a couple of years ago, I've had quite a few positive experiences in my spiritual journey. Opportunities here include working for social justice and showing compassion with First Church's Justice and Mercy team getting out of my comfort zone, learning and serving others on a recent mission trip to Panama. But simply put, what attracted me to First Church is this mindful approach to worship and community, as opposed to being dogmatic and judgmental. It really does my heart good to see folks who have been judged or marginalized elsewhere become fully accepted in our faith community. Everybody deserves a home and that feeling of spiritual freedom. So if you are new here today, we are so glad to have you. We invite you to register your attendance by scanning the QR code on the screen or in your bulletin. So feel free to approach me when you see me and let's chat. We can ex share our experiences at First Church together. I truly feel that First Church walks the walk. I hope you have a blessed day. Hey, my name is Kristen Denman. I'm the Minister of Children, and I'd love to sh share some announcements with you this morning as we move into worship. First up, you are invited on October 4th to join us for a pumpkin painting party following Wednesday night dinner. You can head to the Coming Up tab on our website to learn more and to register for dinners and to sign up for pumpkins. And then next on October 15th at 4 p.m., we will have a domestic violence training hosted by One Place. You can find all the details on our website, but we will have childcare provided. So go ahead and mark your calendar for this important and valuable training. And finally, we are heading to Appalachia. So if you are interested in serving on a spring break trip, March 24th to 29th, intergenerational from seventh grade up, you are invited to reach out to Ashley Hess for more information about what it looks like to serve with the Appalachian Service Project. They are a nonprofit that's been around for decades and they are doing incredible, important work in our country. So head to our website for all the updates. And with that, let's worship.
Good morning. My name is Ashley. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Minister of Youth and Justice. Please hear our call to confession. Faced with God's goodness, we recognize our failings. In the knowledge of God's mercy, we dare to tell the truth about ourselves and our world. In the confidence of God's children, let us confess our sin. Gracious Lord, creator of the universe, in your generosity, you've given us a world of abundance and diversity. Yet we've lived guided by greed and selfishness. We confess that we have defaced your creation and poisoned the environment through our consumerist behavior and for personal gain. In Christ, you made us brothers and sisters and intended us to be united. And yet we have built walls to separate us from those who are different from us. You gave us wisdom and creativity and we have used those to trick each other and to develop weapons of destruction and death. You gave us laws to order our lives and we have abused them to take revenge and punish our enemies. We love war rather than striving for peace. We ignore the poor and weak and honor the rich and powerful. In all this, we have not lived according to your will. Forgive us, Lord, for boasting in our own achievements and failing to recognize that you alone are worthy of our praise. In your mercy, forgive us of our sins. God accepted us simply because of our faith in Christ, through whom our sins were forgiven. May God help us to continue to preach peace to those who are near and far. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Psalm chapter 96, verses 1 through 10. Hear these words. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous work among all peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be revered above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. Tremble before him, all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord is king. The world is firmly established, and it shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Will you pray with me this morning? From every place on this planet, we turn our face to you, O God. Gather us, all your people, together to pray. In the midst of the forces which would separate us, Bind us in your love as the church together. Strengthen us through the grace of your people gathered, no matter how we gather, with the truth of your presence. In a world aching to be made new, we cry out with those who suffer the pains of what powers and principalities extract from the world's poorest. We cry out with those suffering from illness and disease at whom the world turns a callous glance. We cry out with those stinging from the sins of white supremacy. We cry out with those seeking justice, equality, and peace, peace at all times, in all ways. In a world stretching toward wholeness, we celebrate with those whose lives bear the fruit of your spirit and who seek to share in your call to partnership. We celebrate with those whose efforts are making the world new. We celebrate with all who gather to earnestly seek your transforming work in the world. Make us a world that grows into the shape of your communion table, where all are welcomed, all are fed. Make us a people who grow your family by practices of mutuality, generosity, and justice. And may we be found to be witnesses when Jesus returns 
to the truth of who we were created to be, people who belong to each other, people who belong to you, O oh God, and your Son, Jesus. Amen. Each week we end our prayer with the Lord's Prayer. And this morning we will do just that, but we invite you to listen and to watch as we are led in prayer by people speaking the Lord's Prayer in a variety of different languages from around the world. Join me now. And now, O oh God, on this World Communion Sunday, when we celebrate the whole world coming together at Christ's table to know your grace and to feel your presence, we pray together, joining across time and space, in the words you taught your disciples to pray, saying, Papa no kino siella, si puyo respecti no. Ko hai pendin kong praong ma tang yu. Ko hai pen pei tam prathai kong praong. Nai sawan pen yang rai. Ko hai pen yang nan nai pendin lo. Danos hoy nuestro pan de cada día. Perdona nuestras ofensas, así como también nosotros perdonamos a quienes nos ofenden. Wala tu tril na fita jriba. لكن نجينا من الشرير. آمين. 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 In the crushing, in the 
World Communion Sunday offering provides scholarship and leadership development opportunities for international students and U.S. racial ethnic students who are pursuing advanced degrees. Gifts not only make an impact in the lives of these individual students, but they also impact the religious, social, and civic communities in which they lead and serve. These funds are administered by Global Ministries in collaboration with the General Board of Higher Education and Ministry. Your gifts to First Church contribute to the life of these ministries and the ways they support higher education for people around the world. You can do this specifically today with your gift by making a note in your virtual offering online or earmarking your check when you mail it in for the scholarship offering for World Communion. Please consider the impact and importance of your gifts as you give today. And friends, let us now give as we serve and are loved by a generous God. Good morning. My name is Jonathan Goss, and I use he, him pronouns, and I'm one of the pastors here at First Church, and it's so good to be with y'all in virtual worship this morning as we celebrate World Communion Sunday. If you were like me, you may have grown up in a denomination that did not honor and celebrate World Communion Sunday as we do at First Church with millions of Christians around the world. Because I would never celebrated this sacred and holy day, I did not come into World Communion Sunday the first time I experienced it with any idea what it was going to be. And over the years, it has become one of, if not my favorite Sundays of the year because of what its meaning is to us as Christians here at First Church, beyond our campus here in our city, in our state and in our country and world. It is a beautiful symbolic day where Christians around the world unite and name that God's table is open for all of God's people. So this morning, our scripture text comes from Matthew chapter 21, verses 23 through 32. I invite you to hear these words and read along as well. When he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? 
But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not, but later changed his mind and went. The father went to the second son and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of these two did the will of his father? They said the first. Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, The tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of heaven ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him, and even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe in him. So this morning, I want to highlight this text that we're given on this World Communion Sunday and really dig into who Jesus is in the temple saying is welcome, who Jesus is telling these people, these elders, these people of power, these people that hoard authority over people, the people that were exchanging money to let people in this temple, the sacred and holy temple. Jesus is telling these people, you've got it all wrong. You care more about your money, your possessions, your power, your authority, than you do God's people. Jesus is telling them in this context, in their society, that the tax collectors and the prostitutes, they are welcome in the temple. Those were the vulnerable, the marginalized, those considered the least of these. The World Health Organization states that children, pregnant women, Elderly people, malnourished people, and people who are ill or immunocompromised are particularly vulnerable when a disaster strikes and take a high, relatively high share of disease burden associated with emergencies. Poverty and its common consequences, such as malnutrition, hunger, thirst, homelessness, poor housing, poor education, they are all a major contributor to being vulnerable, to being marginalized. In other words, Jesus is telling these elders, these chief priests, the people you will not let into this temple, God's house, they are the ones that need it the most. If you do a little digging around the internet, in our context, you can find specific examples of who are vulnerable, who are marginalized. CultureAlly.com says this, marginalized groups include women, people with disabilities, people of color, LGBTQ plus folks, indigenous people, people of lower socioeconomic status, and so on. These groups that I just named have been historically disempowered, disenfranchised, and oppressed by influential and discriminatory groups. I'm going to say that again. The groups I just named, folks with disability, women, people of color, LGBTQ folks, indigenous people, people living in poverty, they have been the groups that have been disempowered, disenfranchised, and oppressed by influential and discriminatory groups. At First Church, we believe in doing justice. So I'm gonna show you a chart. I want you to look at this chart and it highlights, it gives you a visual of who these people are. So if you look at the demographic, gender, marginalized groups are women, non-binary and gender conforming people. Non-marginalized groups are men. If you look at sexual orientation, asexual, bisexual, fluid, gay, lesbian, queer, questioning, two split, those are the marginalized people. Non-marginalized groups are heterosexuals. If you look at the disability demographic, those that have a disability are often marginalized. Those that are able-bodied are not. Indigenous people, 
So if you're indigenous people in our country in particular, you have been marginalized. And lastly, race and ethnicity. Black, Caribbean, Asian, indigenous, Latin American, and Middle Eastern all have been marginalized. And whites have not. I show you that chart so that you can have a better understanding of who these people are in our context. The term marginalized describes the person or group that is being treated insignificantly or pushed to the margins of society and rendered powerless. Marginalization is the result of discrimination. Discrimination exists in many forms such as racism, sexism, ableism, ageism, homophobia, and xenophobia. There are also more subtle forms of discrimination. I'm going to give you all some stats this morning that help us better understand the who in our context, who would be considered the tax collectors, those that have been vilified by society, and who are the least of these in our culture and context, like the prostitutes. Between 11 to 28% of lesbian, gay, and bisexual employees lost a promotion due to their sexual or orientation. That comes from the Center of American Progress. 27% of transgender employees were fired, not hired or denied a promotion. That also comes from the Center of American Progress. About 42% of American women reported discrimination at work due to their gender. That comes from the Pew Research Center. American women were nearly three times more likely than their male counterparts to experience sexual harassment at work. That comes from the Pew Research Center. Over 80,000 workplace discrimination charges are filed each year in the United States. This is based off race, gender, identity, and sexuality. And lastly, in the United States, 42% of employees have experienced or witnessed racism at work. So when I think about who these people are in our context, they're, they're your neighbor. They're your coworker. They're people that you love. And we as a church believe in doing justice. We believe that when there is injustice anywhere in the world, there is injustice everywhere in the world, as Dr. King taught us. So when I think about our neighbors at First Church who are experiencing disenfranchisement, that are being oppressed, I think about the homeless people that sleep in our courtyard. I think about the single mother trying to scrape enough money together to put groceries and food on their table. I think about the woman that is escaping an abusive relationship. I think of the immigrants that try to gain freedom and liberation and they put their self and families at risk and end up being detained in a foreign land. I think about folks that live in nursing homes, the elderly that are lonely and that need love and support. When we look around our neighbors here in downtown Birmingham, in your neighborhoods, in your communities, you can find people that are vulnerable. So I wanna give context to the text we heard from Matthew. So prior to what we heard, Jesus enters the temple and he's angry. He turns over tables at the situation, at the system that's in place. And later we receive the words that I read in Matthew. Jesus had this triumphal entry into Jerusalem. There's a crowd, people are talking. There are all these expectations placed upon Jesus as he entered the city. And he, he goes to the temple and he sees what's happening. He sees the chief priests, the elders, taking advantage of those that have less than. Excluding them from the temple. Excluding them from God's table. And he enters the temple. He turns over tables and he throws out the money changers. So if you ask a question like Jesus asked the chief priests and the elders, 
If you ask yourself a question, who would have been the most threatened by these actions? Is precisely the people that Jesus was talking to, the chief priests and the elders. Jesus told the chief priests and the elders that tax collectors and prostitutes, they are included in the kingdom of God. Tax collectors in the Bible, we know as a group, they're characterized as being greedy, taking from those that are on the bottom and giving to those that are on top and keeping more for themselves. They were a group that were looked down upon and despised and villainized by their society. We see this in the story of Jesus and Zacchaeus, the tax collector, and in the calling of Matthew as a disciple. Jesus uses this group, this group that has been vilified, that might not be marginalized perhaps in terms of money or power or authority, but they have been marginalized. He uses them as an example of who is welcome into the kingdom of God. I find it interesting and also puzzling at the same time when I look into the commentaries on verse 31. Truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and prostitutes are going to enter the kingdom of God ahead of you, the chief priests and elders. Prostitution isn't nearly as much talked about as tax collectors in our holy tax. You can look at most commentaries and they go on and on about the system in place in tax collectors. Roman law, Caesar, and how tax collectors fed into that system that was robbing people and families of their livelihoods, of their food, of their housing, and perhaps most importantly, their humanity. But what about the prostitutes? I wonder what type of person would have been a prostitute. Perhaps a young orphan child that no one could afford or wanted. Destitute, alone. Or maybe a widow in their society was told they had no longer had value. They no longer were worthy. They no longer were good enough. Young women whose families were trapped in a cycle of oppression and poverty likely placed upon them by their chief priest, their elders, money changers in the temple, and by tax collectors in Rome. That system shut every door of opportunity to her. So she resorted to a life of prostitution. And what does Jesus say to her? Jesus says, child. You are good. You are worthy. And you're included in the kingdom of God because everyone is included in the kingdom of God. Everyone is welcome in this temple. Everyone is welcome at God's table. From Rahab to Mary Magdalene, God has told us that everyone Those that have taken too much, like the tax collectors that have been greedy, that we villainize, they're welcome at God's table. And so is the young woman who had no other option in this society except to become a prostitute. They are both included. As I mentioned this morning is World Communion Sunday, and it is such a beautiful Sunday that we celebrate with people of all walks of life all around the world. As I was preparing for my sermon, I wanted to find a video that would get to the heart of the matter. And to be honest, I searched and searched and just could not find something better than a video that we have shared here at First Church since 2020. Years ago, I asked Jeff Nadu, whose mom was a minister for the South African Church, I asked him if he would tell a story about communion. It is a story of pain and suffering and hurt, a story of people being disenfranchised, people being oppressed. And yet Jeff has, through this hard story, 
believed and clung to the hope that we have in Jesus Christ that tells each child that you're good enough, that you're welcomed, that you're loved, that we have a seat at the table for you. I invite you. It's true what they say about the African sun. It is absolutely merciless. I remember the sun blazing that day. As the lone tractor wended its way slowly up the hill towards the township filled with thousands of broken down tin tracks, that the lifeless body of a young woman lay in its trailer. Toiling all day in the fields under the scalding African sky without adequate water and food had finally taken its toll on her fragile body. She had collapsed in exhaustion earlier that afternoon and succumbed to death almost immediately. And then she had to endure that final indignity. Her body was unceremoniously thrown into the back of a tractor trailer and taken away while her friends had to continue tilling the soil in their heat. And Tombi would never have a chance to live into the fullness of what her life could have been. And Tombi could never have dared to have hopes and dreams. And Tombi, you see, was a child of South Africa's apartheid era. In that moment, the full weight of the injustice of apartheid descended on my shoulders in what I could only describe as an avalanche. Only a child of myself, I wept uncontrollably as the tractor disappeared from view. I wept for Ntombi. I wept for her family. I wept for all people of color in our country. This was just another familiar scene in our reality, our reality of of exclusion. Indignities like these were commonplace in South Africa. The product of our second class citizenship as persons of color. Apartheid in South Africa was about so much more than separate bathrooms, separate beaches, separate benches, separate train platforms. The denial of basic human rights to people of color meant that on the day that Ntombi had died, Many, many in a township would not have been able to feed their children that day. Many more would have died from something as simple as diarrhea. And thousands of children would have been at home because they did not have the privilege of being able to go to school, get educated, and break the cycle of poverty that was thrust upon us. We were simply excluded from the table. So understanding and embracing the value and importance of being included at the table is not something I had to grow into, but something I grew up with. But on World Communion Sunday, no matter who we were or where we came from, we got a seat at the table. We got welcomed as first class citizens and we got to feel the power of unity with fellow children of God throughout the world. It was there we could dare to dream and hope. My name is Jeff Naidu, and I'm a preacher's kid from South Africa. On that night, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke the bread. He gave it to his disciples and said, take eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was over, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks, gave it to the disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is the new covenant of love poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us pray. And so in remembrance of the life and acts of Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves as a family of faith.
Together we will work and strive to bring your kingdom on earth and we will be unified in our living by the love of Christ Jesus. Holy Spirit, you are ever present in our lives, in this room and in our homes this morning. We ask that you pour out your spirit on these simple elements of bread and wine, that in the breaking of the bread and drinking from this cup, we may know Christ and be renewed as the body of Christ for the world. Amen. This morning, I invite you to find something in your home, bread, juice, crackers, coffee, however you see fit, and take the bread, eat, Because this is the body of Christ given to you in forgiveness of your sins. And may you take the cup and drink from it and know that a new covenant of love was poured out for many for their forgiveness. And as we do it, may we remember who Jesus is calling us to welcome at the table. My favorite thing about World Communion Sunday in particular at a United Methodist Church is that the table does not belong to any institution or denomination. No church owns the table. It's God's table. And at God's table, tax collector, prostitutes, single moms, those living in poverty, those with disabilities, those immigrants, they are all welcome. Thanks be to God for that is the good news. Amen. Dikurupirira mungu atate wampa vyonse olenga za kumwamba ndiza pansi. Yenye su Kristo su uniko hijo Señor nuestro. Yenje se počal z Ducha Svatého, narodil se z Marie Pany. Di geleden heeft onder Pontius Pilatus is gekruisigd, gestorven en begraven nedergedaald ter helle Tin triti mera na standa apo ton nekron anelthonda sto suranus kathezomenon en dexia theu patros pando dinam Afianu ye afinit sapan filosima Kapa tau che wang zai na pavinyan borisut la che man na sa kon kritza borisut O bisharikat el kuddisin o bimaghfirat el khataya a test feltámadását és az örök életet. Ámen.
as you go out into the world, be of good faith, cling to hope, and follow Jesus, and seek out those that have been marginalized. Bring justice to the world that is so full of injustice. We do that because we follow and believe in Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. Thanks be to God. Go in peace.